What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. Today, we are diving into some of the world's most haunted objects. According to Wikipedia, curses any express wish that some form of adversity or misfortune will befall or attach to one or more persons or place or an object. The Dybbuk was once considered to be a devil or a demon that entered the body of a sick person or a sinner who had concealed their sin. On the back of the box, the confession of faith the Shema had been carved into the wood. Ever since, many believe that Post Malone, including himself, has been cursed by the box. James Dean. At only 24 years old, he would die in a near head-on collision in his 1955 Porsche 550 Spider. He told James, please never get in it. If you get in that car, you will be found dead in it by this time next week. Light out, everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I'm joined in the haunted studio by my co-host, Austin. Hey, what's up, man? What up, buddy? And my producer, Daniel. How's it going, everybody? Today, we are diving into some of the world's most haunted objects, including the infamous Dybbuk box. I've been wanting to talk about this, this thing for so, so long. To start things out though, how do you guys feel about cursed objects? Do you think that an inanimate object can be cursed? Uh, I'm not, I'm not really sold on something manifesting a physical object. I don't know. I feel like it's just, I can more get on board with ghosts because they're ethereal and they don't, it's not tangible. But once it becomes tangible, I, I just get really super skeptical of it. Well, even after after researching this episode, you think that? Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm more, I would be more convinced where they could inhabit maybe something with a soul or where there once was a soul or something. But I think since inanimate objects are just... Objects at the end of the day yeah. that they can't... You don't think that they can harbor some sort of like paranormal energy? They don't seem like a strong enough vessel to have something inhabit it. What if there's a physical attachment to that particular object? As in like what? Like it's something that that person uses for a long period of time. Because like when you're actually touching an object day in, day out, is it possible you transfer some of your, the essence of you or whatever type of energy you want to call mm. it to that object? <sighs> no. Yeah, I'm just, I don't know. I, I don't think objects really hold m much spiritual value. I think that's why I don't, I okay. just don't think that we can, I don't think they can glean things from us. I just, I don't know. I'm not really sold on it. But. So what about a haunted house? That's a technically an inanimate object. That's a good point. And we've covered a number of paranormal cases where there's all sorts of wild paranormal activity in this house, but maybe there's never been you know, a death or something. I think it's more so because we inhabit these places. Like you don't inhabit, I don't inhabit this coffee cup. I mean, it brings me you joy. You pretty much but, do yeah. though. Let's be honest. You're, you hold on to that I thing do. all day long. <laughs> that's so. true. That is true. If you go, that's that going to be haunted. Yeah, then. definitely. It's going to be some, I mean, I hope it goes on forever. Just great cups of coffee and doesn't really cause anyone trouble, but because it's done me well. But yeah, I don't know. I think houses are a little bit different because we, there's experiences within and it's the souls, our souls are inside these places. So maybe I, I th that adds a bit more than just something that we access like this computer. I get it. Yeah. I mean, that makes, that makes sense. What about you, Daniel? Do you have a, any initial thoughts on curses and cursed objects? I mean, we all know that I'm a bit of a skeptic. So believing in ghosts in the first place is kind of an iffy subject for me, but I will say that if it is true, I see no reason why they can't inhabit an object. I see no reason why they can't interact with it, why they can't, especially if it has some sort of emotional connection. If they, if the person alive has some sort of emotional connection uh, to an object, I see no reason why that object wouldn't be sort of like a vessel or like a, uh, uh, a portal or some sort of like contact point to the other side, so to speak. Yeah, that's, that's a really good perspective. 
So do you guys lean more towards the the typical scientific explanation for cursed objects where it's because somebody has said that this object is cursed or hexed that that then makes the person who's in possession of that object fear that object because they fear being under a curse or affected by something supernatural and so it's more so your mind plays tricks on you type of thing yeah probably more like a placebo kind of effect like if someone gives you something and they like, say hey this, this is incredibly is, cursed mm. you'll probably have more weird experiences with it just because it's always going to be in the back of your mind but with that said i might eat my words because we do have annabelle always standing over our shoulder and there's been some weird things in this studio so i don't know could be her you never know so just just for those that maybe don't understand the official definition for a curse so according to wikipedia curse is any expressed wish that some form of adversity or misfortune will befall or attach to one or more persons or place or an object in particular curse may refer to such a wish or pronouncement made effective by a supernatural or spiritual power such as a god or gods a spirit or natural force or else a kind of spell by magic or witchcraft and a curse can also be called a hex or a jinx so ultimately as does everything with the paranormal it really comes down to your personal beliefs and if you believe in the concept of magic i think is is really the at the foundation of all this like do you believe in magic and what does magic look like to you for me personally I do believe in magic. I really do. I think there's too many unexplained things that go on. And maybe magic is just something that is yet to be discovered by science or explained by the natural laws of physics or, or something along those lines. But I do believe in, in mysticism. And I just think it goes way too far back in history for me to, to just completely ignore it and think that it's just coincidences that are happening. And too many people have experiences with haunted objects that I don't think you can completely dismiss it and just be like all these people were just you know making this up in their head or something else was was causing them to have this experience and as you'll see in this episode people who come in contact with these boxes even face physical harm and death and is there a connection to the objects as a result of their death we'll see but I don't think you can completely dismiss it. I think you still have to be open to all possibilities. And with that being said, we're covering several different haunted objects today, including the Dybbuk box, which I mentioned before. But before we jump into the episode, I did want to remind everybody that you can become a Lights Out Low Life via the link in our description or show notes. If you're listening over on Spotify, it's basically our kind of exclusive fan club. And thank you to everybody who's joined. I think we're just about to hit 100 members, which is um, awesome. Nice. And there's tons of perks to that. Um, all that's listed out on the membership page. Um, but yeah, come join us over on YouTube. It's a YouTube membership exclusive. And we've got all sorts of cool stuff going on over there. But let's go ahead and just jump right in to haunted objects. So like I just mentioned before, curses can affect or inhabit people, places, and even things. And the earliest known curses date back to the Mesopotamians thousands of years ago. They were often used to ward off evil and wrongdoing. And by the time the Egyptians had built the pyramids, some of the oldest known curses were carved into the walls of the great Pharaoh's tombs to stop thieves from looting. And if you know anything about the Pharaoh's curse, that is one that I really do believe. And I, and I think that's where a lot of people maybe just like dismiss the idea that objects can carry curses. But I think when you look at the Pharaoh's curse, which is very, very interesting, I, we actually covered it on the Malhar podcast, my other show in great detail. And it's honestly insane how many people who came in contact with the Pharaoh's sarcophagus ended up dying and getting all sorts of diseases and ailments and after that my belief in them went through the roof oh yeah because there's just really no other way to explain it there's just far too many coincidences that i don't 
think would ever really happen unless they had come in contact with with the pharaoh's sarcophagus and do you think it was tombs. the actual um mummy itself or do you actually think it was because it was inside of the tomb well some of them just went inside the tomb right so that's why i see i can get more on board with the tomb being cursed because it's this place that has been inhabited but like as far as objects go i'm not sure but yeah i'm definitely but others who just took the the actual sarcophagus itself out oh, of it really? and taking okay. it out of it and moving it somewhere else gotcha wow where they suffered all sorts of tragic ends of their life so i think that was king tut right yeah, yeah. king tut i think if there's anybody that really understood the magical mystic realm it was the egyptians and i think i don't think we're take we take their knowledge seriously enough because i think they were tapped into something far more intricate and advanced than most of us can even wrap our heads around today and oftentimes we've just chalked it up to stories and legend but i do believe the ancient civilizations and you can look at all the different ancient cultures of of you know the history of, of the world and you start realizing that they all had this belief in mysticism to some extent and this belief in supernatural powers that can be carried on and i don't think they just spent all this time writing curses and hexes and putting them on these different objects for no reason yeah i they, feel like everything they, they did was with purpose right and just the fact that they built those pyramids because they believed that their pharaohs were essentially gods is a testament to how strongly they believed in that right well the the pharaohs weren't even found in the pyramids do you know that god i'm just gonna sound like a dummy this episode i guess <laughs> no That's no crazy. a lot of it's a it's a major misconception actually that people believe and this is what they taught us in school right they taught us in school that the pyramids were built for the pharaohs but the evidence shows that that's not what the pyramids were built for at all the pharaohs were found in uh different different parts of egypt and different different tombs and things like that but there was no pharaoh ever taken out of the pyramids great pyramids yeah wow. so the pyramids themselves and their purpose is still a giant mystery and there's a lot of theories as to why they built the pyramids um but it's not related to the death i thought of the, the pharaohs the reason they didn't find the bodies in the pyramids were because they were looted beforehand that's like what the they like to tell ages. you yeah but there's okay. no evidence of of the pharaohs ever being found there gotcha. all the pharaohs that have ever been found have been outside of the great pyramids gotcha of egypt yeah so that's a whole nother episode but i know maybe we should return to King we Tuts should curse. we should dive into even just ancient egypt and some of the supernatural stories from from their history because i think a lot of what we know about the spiritual realm and and the paranormal even stems back to mesopotamia and in egypt so there's a there's definitely a lot to cover there but it is believed that many of these cursed objects that have that are often very very old have even cost people their lives so that brings us to the first cursed object we're going to talk about today and it comes from a place known for bourbon horse racing and coal the great bluegrass state of kentucky in pulaski county strip mines now litter the fields where miners used to harvest coal in the early 1930s and now these days many of those mines have been abandoned and they're mostly an eyesore but at one point they might have saved us from a cursed object that killed five people and maybe even more as the legend goes a man named carl pruitt returned home one day in 1938 he spent his whole day woodworking as a carpenter but left work early to surprise his wife when he got home he expected to see her in the kitchen cooking dinner but when he got there he returned to find his wife naked in bed with another man which this just sent him over the edge full of rage he started charging straight for his wife the naked man jumped out of the bedroom window to safety after Carl pinned down his wife, he then grabbed the closest deadly weapon that he could find within reach, which was a length of chain. He then wrapped it around his wife's neck in the heat of passion and ended up strangling her to death. Carl then sat on the edge of his bed, slowly realizing what he had just done. And he decided that he couldn't live with himself. So he took a pistol and shot himself in the head. 
Carl and his wife were buried in separate cemeteries, and as time passed, Carl's fresh plot of earth began to grow patches of grass. But the grass grew in strange circular patterns, almost in the shape of a chain. As more time passed, Carl's granite headstone became discolored. Locals noticed that the outline of a chain could actually be seen through the discoloration, and the rumors of the strange headstone and the history of the brutal murder-suicide became the talk of the town. And the popularity drew in a few locals. One day, a group of boys rode their bikes to the cemetery to check out Carl's headstone. One of the boys, James Collins, started throwing rocks at the headstone, and each throw slowly chipped away the granite. Off in the distance, the boys noticed the groundskeeper slowly approaching them. Thinking they would get in trouble, they decided to take off. But as James hopped on his bike and began to pedal, he quickly lost control and crashed into a tree. The other boys quickly went over to check on him. And that's when they found him, dead. His lifeless body rested against the tree, but they noticed that he hadn't actually died from the crash. When they got a closer look, James' bike chain had somehow come off of the gears and wrapped around his neck and strangled him to death. After the boy's funeral and burial, the other boys returned to the cemetery and they noticed the damage to Carl Pruitt's headstone had been reversed. There was no visible damage from where James had been throwing stones. Only the outline of the chain remained. Weeks later, long after James's funeral, his mother was doing laundry when she noticed one of James's shirts in the mix. This sent her into a spiral of grief. After taking a pickaxe from the shed, she headed to the cemetery in rage. She spent half an hour chipping away the granite headstone until it was rubble. And as she stood back and looked at her work, she felt relieved. It wouldn't bring back her son, but smashing the gravestone to pieces somehow felt pretty great. After returning home, she finished up the laundry and draped the damp clothes over the clothesline in the backyard. And as she tossed over the last piece of clothing, the clothesline somehow wrapped around her neck and strangled her to death. In some versions of the story, the clothesline was supposedly a long chain. When she was buried in the local cemetery, friends and family noticed that Carl Pruitt's gravestone had once again reassembled itself like it had never been touched. And like always, that chain outline was still visible on the granite. So as the gravestone became more infamous, tourists began traveling to the cemetery to test the gravestone out for themselves. One day, a farmer traveled through the area in his horse-drawn carriage after selling some crops in town. As he passed the cemetery, he picked up his rifle, shouldered it, aimed it, found the gravestone with the chain outline on it and fired one time. The bullet shattered a chunk of granite, but the gunfire also at the same time spooked his horse and in fear, the horse bolted at full speed. As the carriage lurched, the farmer was thrown forward off his seat. His head was then somehow caught in the trace chain that connected the horse's harness to the carriage. Locals later found the farmer dead on the side of the road with his neck still mangled in the chain. And again, Carl Pruitt's gravestone was found undamaged the next day. After this, more time passed, and the gravestone has drawn so much attention that a local congressman ordered two police officers to go check it out. They pulled into the cemetery in their squad car and stepped out to take a look at the infamous chain outlined gravestone. They joked and laughed about the old legend and the people it had killed. They even took a few funny photos in front of the legendary gravestone and then got back in their car. As they got back in the car, and pulled a U-turn, heading back toward an entrance. A strange light flashed in the rearview mirror, and as they both looked back, it seemed like the light was actually chasing the car. In a panic, the driver stepped on the gas, and he quickly lost control of the wheel, and the squad car swerved between two fence posts connected by, you guessed it, a chain. The officer in the passenger seat flew from the car and survived his injuries, but the driver wasn't so lucky. The driver was found strangled by the chain that connected the posts. The final death was of a man named Arthur Lewis who became obsessed with Carl Pruitt's gravestone. After sundown one evening, he took a hammer and chisel and began chipping off pieces of granite. A group of locals gathered at the edge of the nearby churchyard to watch. Each blow to the gravestone rang out, a loud sound throughout the night. One by one, he slowly chipped away at the granite and he hoped this careful destruction of the gravestone would finally put an end to the curse. But as a surprise to absolutely no one, 
the man was found dead by morning. A chain from the cemetery's front gate was found wrapped around his throat. The hammer and chisel were found lying on the ground beside him, but Carl Prude's gravestone was in perfect condition. After this, locals finally had enough of this cursed gravestone. Many families began exhuming bodies and selling off their plots until Carl Pruitt was the only one left. And his headstone of cursed granite might have kept on killing locals, but luckily, the property was sold off to a mining company. By 1958, the area had become a strip mine, and the gravestone was lost. No one exactly knows what happened to Carl Pruitt's gravestone, and his remains were never claimed. Many assumed that they had been sealed in concrete beneath the surface, the stone later fell into the mix of rubble. It might still be uncovered one day, unleashing this horrible curse all over again, but luckily no one has seen it for decades. The earliest recording of this cursed gravestone appeared back in 1996. Some have tried to find the documented history of the story to see if the legends are true, and they found a death certificate of a man named Enos C. Pruitt in 1950 who died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound and only one known photo of the man is believed to exist. Here he is. So is this Carl? We don't know for sure. This is the one that has circulated, and they believe it is Carl, but no one knows for sure. So what do you think about this? What are your, what are your theories on what happened here? If everything is true, as told in this story, how do you explain this? See, I, is somebody running around with a chain, killing people at the... At the graveyard here i would certainly hope not but for me the story is it's uh or you just think it's a tall tale i i mean it's a good story it's a little bit too perfect though right that the chain is consistently always killing the people but i would if this is actually happening i wouldn't know how to explain um, it is different chains though right it's yeah the same, it's not the same same one. type of material but it's different it's not like it's this ghost chain that's flying around true yeah killing so it's, people so it's like the cursed object is more the headstone than it is the chain. The chain is just what's being manipulated, I guess. Because it seems like if you fuck with his gravestone at all, death is going to find you. Yeah. And it just happens to be in the form of a chain, which is weird because it seems like pretty consistently everybody's seen the outline of, of the chain on his gravestone. So it seems that the two are connected. A good rule of thumb, though, is to just respect the dead, especially cemeteries. I don't know who's going who's in going here. to chip down a headstone. Yeah, it sounds like a bad idea. Yeah, no even matter. if they're terrible people, I just would leave it alone, right? Danny, any uh, comments on this one? I mean, not so much a comment as um, maybe an explanation for why the curse stopped. Uh, I mean, a mining company bought the plot of land, so I think the idea of it being encased in concrete is a more respectful thought than what actually happened. I imagine that the mining company just stripped the whole land and got rid of the body since no one claimed it and just churned up the granite tombstone. And it's, everything's gone at it's this point. It's been decimated. Yeah, I think it's just decimated. I don't think there's any, I don't think it's under the ground anywhere. I think the mining company just destroyed it. I mean, if we learned anything from Lake Lanier, we, they don't care about bodies. Like, yeah, that's that, is, more that is true. I do think it's possible that the mining company may have had some mishaps going on and they probably just covered up or it was never released to the public. So the site wouldn't get shut yeah, down. You exactly. Think? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, talking about mass amounts of money there. So if so, you know, something did happen unless it was really, really bad and you know, there's no way to cover that up, but yeah, true. it's possible that things did happen. But my guess is it probably just got absolutely decimated from, the excavation and everything but what do you think about gravestones being cursed or i mean growing up it seems like all of us were probably afraid of the graveyard you know visiting the graveyard because you know you always heard ghost stories about things being seen in the graveyard do you think the graveyard is a, a place for paranormal activity i think the same way that a house could be it's like where some soul is inhabiting that area it's kind of the same with the cemetery. So yeah, I'd be down with that. So maybe this is not so much a cursed gravestone as it is just Carl. Yeah. Wreaking havoc in this, True. this area. 
and that maybe the grave the gravestone is just a physical indication of some other type of paranormal activity that's going on there because they did see that light right the police officers yeah. didn't even manipulate the headstone too but they claim they saw a light and then they, they crashed lost the control car. yeah i guess my question for you guys would be is what do you think is more likely to be haunted the resting place of a person or the location in which they died that's a good question i think it just i think it could be both could be ultimately depending on the individual but there is a reason that people oftentimes report seeing spirits and all sorts of orbs and all sorts of other types of paranormal activity in graveyards i mean we've we've covered uh several graveyards over over the years and union cemetery i remember union was cemetery one. that was a war and it was one. like even around it mm -hmm. you know what i mean the immediate area had a lot of strange things popping up yeah the woman in white people would always see their orbs and stuff like that because i think the difference with a graveyard versus the site where somebody somebody passes in the graveyard you got multiple individuals most of the time right you've got a lot of different souls in one place and i feel like the probability of of paranormal activity goes up significantly just from the sheer amount of people all you know hyper focused in one geographical location yeah it's like Pavalia too, right? Right. All the bodies there. Exactly. With the holiday season quickly approaching, make sure you're prepared to ship all those packages for your business. Or, you know, maybe you have a huge family and you've got a lot of packages to send out. Doesn't mean that you got to stress out. Stamps.com has been helping businesses and individuals like you save time and money for 25 years, and it can help you get ready for the holiday ramp up. All you need is Stamps.com's premium rates for all your postage needs. I've been using Stamps.com for a number of years for both of my businesses, and it has saved me so much money because they give you exclusive discounts you can't get anywhere else, like up to 84% off of USPS and UPS rates, which helps out your bottom line. Plus, Stamps.com automatically tells you the cheapest and fastest shipping options. But the best thing about Stamps.com is it eliminates the need to actually go to the post office altogether. All you need to use stamps.com is a computer and a printer, and they'll even send you a free scale. So you've got everything you need to get started, get access to the USPS and UPS services you need right from your computer anytime, day or night. There's no lines, no traffic, and no waiting. So get your business ready for the holiday rush and get started with stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code lights out for a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com. Click that microphone at the top of the homepage and enter code lights out. Make sure you enter that all together. So moving on to our next cursed item, the one you've all been waiting for. This is, uh, has to do with a Dybbuk, which I didn't know exactly what a Dybbuk was until I had to research it a little bit, but supposedly in Jewish folklore, the Dybbuk is an evil spirit that enters a living person, splits their soul in two, speaks through the living person and also manifests an entire separate personality. I thought in a lot of ways, it sounds almost like a classic possession case, right? In Talmudic literature, which is the central text for rabbinic Judaism, this entity roughly translates to unclean spirit. And the root of the word also stems from the rough translation, which means to cleave, like it cleaves the spirit, it splits the spirit in two. The Dybbuk was once considered to be a devil or a demon that entered the body of a sick person or a sinner who had concealed their sin. And the sin opens a portal where the Dybbuk could enter. Sometimes these are considered the spirits of the dead who were not properly laid to rest. So the soul has somehow transformed into a demon. Or their souls were stripped or denuded and they saw refuge in the bodies of the living. Some within the Jewish faith can exercise these demons, and they can also provide restoration to the afflicted person's souls, much like a Catholic priest is believed to be able to uh, correct someone's possession and kind of bring them back to square one. Some can even cast the Dybbuk back straight into hell, which I thought was interesting. In some forms of mysticism, though, it's believed that the demon can transmigrate into a physical object. As far as I could tell, this is not according to any Jewish text or belief, but in some forms of mysticism, people believe that this can occur. 
Strange enough, one of the most famous occurrences of this actually happening is way outside Jewish folklore, and it began, sure enough, in 2001 in Portland, Oregon. A man in his 30s named Kevin Manis checked out at an estate sale to find things for his hole-in-the-wall furniture business. The house was once owned by a Jewish woman who recently passed, and while at the house, the woman's granddaughter told Kevin about the woman's story. Supposedly, she had survived the Holocaust after the rest of her family, including her husband, were killed by the Nazis. She later fled to Spain, where she lived until the end of the war. As Kevin searched through the woman's house, he came across a strange wooden box about the size of a backpack. The two doors were carved with vines and grapes, and they were held by large metal hinges. The granddaughter told Kevin it was a wine cabinet that her grandmother had bought in Spain, and this was one of three items that she brought with her to the United States. The granddaughter had always been told to never touch the box. When she asked what was inside, her grandmother spat three times between her fingers and said, Dybbuk. Not knowing what that was, Kevin decided to buy the box, and the granddaughter was glad to get rid of it. When he got it back to his furniture store, he opened it up and dug a little deeper. It had been engineered that when the two doors were opened, a small drawer at the bottom also opened. On the back of the box, the confession of faith, the Shema, had been carved into the wood. When he opened the doors, he found two wheat pennies from the 1920s, a lock of blonde hair, a small statue with an engraving of the word Shalom, and a dried rosebud, a golden goblet, and a cast iron candle holder with legs that looked like short tentacles. He planned on refinishing the box and giving it to his mother as a birthday gift. And at first, he really didn't notice anything off about the box. But quickly, strange things began to happen after bringing it back to his store. One day, he left the shop for an hour and left a saleswoman to watch the store. He later got a frantic call from her saying that someone was in the shop smashing things and shouting curses. When he told her to leave, she screamed that she was trapped inside. Somehow the security gate was locked and so was the emergency exit and his phone battery went dead. When he raced back to his store, he found the whole place trashed and what smelled like ammonia and cat urine filled the air. He found his employee on the floor sobbing hysterically. None of the lights worked and he discovered that all the light bulbs had been shattered and his employee never returned to work after that. Kevin still hadn't connected the strange event to the cabinet so it still sat in his shop. Another time he began seeing shadowy figures out of the corner of his eye, and while he slept, he was constantly visited by the old hag in his nightmares. In these nightmares, he'd be walking on an isolated street with one of his closest friends or family members, and he would watch them slowly transform into a demonic old woman. Then he would wake up with mysterious cuts and bruises across his body. Still, he didn't think that that wine box had anything to do with it. He eventually refinished the box and he gave it to his mother, Ida, for her birthday. After he left, his mother later described a cold breeze every time the box was opened and eventually experienced pure evil coming out of it. After this, she suffered a stroke. And when he saw her next, the only word she could speak to him was, no gift and hate gift. It was at this point that he was convinced that there was something strange about that wine box. By 2003, he was so desperate to get rid of it that he put the cursed box up for sale on eBay, but he didn't want to trick anyone into buying it. In the item's description, he gave every potential buyer a warning. He explained in detail how he thought something was seriously wrong with the box, and he needed someone experienced in the paranormal to take it off his hands. He didn't even put up a minimum sale amount before the auction went live, and it ended up selling for just $140. The lucky buyer of the box was a college student from Missouri named Yosef Nitschke. It's unclear why he wanted the box, or if he was even a paranormal expert, but after he got it in the mail, strange things started happening to him too. He and his roommates started getting mysterious allergic reactions. They'd also get lethargic near the box, and bad smells would fill the room. Other times, they would even shut off their electronic devices. And then... They all started seeing shadowy figures, just like Kevin had, and they even began losing clumps of hair. Less than a year after owning the box, Yosef put it back on eBay and sold it for $280. The next lucky owner was a man named Jason Haxton. He was the director of the Museum of Osteopathic Medicine at A.T. Still University in Missouri. And just like the others, he began having strange physical reactions to the box. But this time, he thought they were helping him. 
He even called the box the fountain of youth because it had supposedly reversed his aging process. It was so special to him that he would store it in a special acacia wood box lined in gold. He then wrote an entire book about it in 2011, created a website for it, and appeared in several interviews to talk about its healing properties. But then in 2017, the box had become so famous that you know who, Zach Bagans, the star of Ghost Adventures, knew he had to add it to his haunted museum collection. So he went and bought it. Some reports say he bought it for as much as $10,000 and he then placed it in his haunted museum in Las Vegas. And as you can imagine, the Dybbuk box quickly became a centerpiece of his museum. It was even featured on the physical tickets to the museum with the words, the world's most haunted object. It's now encased in a glass display case and it's surrounded by two rings of salt and dried sage. There's a spot in the salt ring where it's been slightly disturbed and it's been reported that the doors of the box have opened up on their own. In 2018, I'm sure many of you have probably seen this, but Post Malone guest starred on Zach Bagan's Ghost Adventures. In 2018, Post Malone paid a visit to Zach Bagan's museum on an episode of Ghost Adventures. And Zach later released infrared security footage showing Post Malone's visit to the museum. There's no audio, but in this clip, you can clearly see Post Malone going into the room that contains the Dybbuk box. And he seems disturbed by something. Zach touched the box with one hand and Post Malone went up and pushed his shoulder to get him off of the box. And supposedly after this interaction, he saw a dark figure later that night. Ever since, many believe that Post Malone, including himself, has been cursed by the box. And not long after, he had a string of bad luck. He had an emergency plane landing because the landing wheels were damaged. He got into a high-speed car accident and he had his house broken into by armed robbers. It's pretty wild. Poor Posty. Right after, I know. Yeah, pretty brutal. Now, keep in mind, this is actually the first Dybbuk box, or this is really just the first Dybbuk object that's ever been recorded. Like I said earlier, it's believed that the Dybbuk can infest a physical object, but this is the first one we know of, and it's not exactly correlated with a Jewish folklore. But it's had its for sure controversy. The original owner, Kevin Manis, who was the man who bought uh, the object at the estate sale way back, he later posted in 2015 saying that if anyone could find a reference to the Dybbuk box anywhere in history before his eBay post in 2003, he would pay them $100,000 and tattoo their name on his forehead. So he was pretty confident that he was kind of the originator in this. Then in 2021, he admitted it was all a story he had made up. He admitted it was just a good way to practice creative writing. But I don't know, some people still say it. These weird things have happened with the box, so maybe it's not just a creative writing practice. So he admitted to just making up the whole story? Yeah. I mean, he's clearly still got the box and then sold it. But as far as I know, he just said all the haunted things that he said about it were just made up. Why would he say that after the fact, though? Like, how does that... Maybe he's trying to, like, get it back in some way. Like, mm. if he admits that, oh, there's nothing it's up worthless. with this box. Yeah. It's worthless. You know, you're a fool, Zach, for spending tens of thousands of dollars on this thing. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure. That maybe what Zach is. would get rid of it and maybe he'd be able to get it back. Right. So he could then make money off there of it. There might be some motive behind that. I'm not sure exactly. Because that was, I mean, this was clear, 2021. So this was years after it's hit right. its peak popularity. And then all of a sudden he just is like, I made it up. I don't know. That's fishy to me. Yeah. The box though became so popular that even if you go on eBay today, you can just find endless Oh, yeah. boxes people just they actually like make them sometimes they're like 3d printed or, or whatever but they're all over the place now it also inspired the horror movie the possession back in 2012 and that's uh produced by sam raimi one of my favorites and kevin manis was credited for consulting on that production. bingo there's your motive he wants to make money off this yeah. he clearly saw how much money this was bringing in for zach bagans which there's a lot of controversy around him and his museum and everything. But I will say countless people visit his museum. 
and nearly every single one of them have some sort of ex either experience or feel something off about that place. I mean, the amount of haunted objects that he has in this museum and artifacts, uh, it, it has a reputation for having a lasting effect on people that visit. Yeah, and maybe Zach Bagans didn't loop him in because he was the original owner and he kind of felt this sense of ownership over this object and it's and it's haunted attributes that maybe he thought he was left out of the loop by Zach Bagans by not having him as what I'm not sure so after it got super popular he's like oh it's also a hoax because you didn't maybe he didn't loop him in on it it sounds like he's just salty yeah. that he's not able to profit off of this thing but then to add to the fact that it still might be a hoax, or maybe Kevin Manis just didn't know what it actually was to begin with, some researchers have pointed out that this particular box isn't actually a Jewish wine cabinet from Spain. It's most likely a mini bar made in New York sometime in the mid 20th century. Now, I don't know the details of how they figured that out, and I'm not a, I'm not a professional mini bar uh, aficionado, so... <laughs> I'm not sure about that one, but supposedly people pointed out that, hey, this make and model of this wine, this mini bar. They must have found something says. similar to it. That's and, what I'm And assuming. that's what they're comparing it to. Yeah. So its origins aren't really clear, which has brought a lot of controversy and why a lot of people claim it's a big hoax now. But I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think you could say it's all big hoax for every single object that's <laughs> so claimed true. to be haunted, right? Yeah. Like you could say anything that, is in Zach Bagan's museum is just a hoax. True. And that the story isn't true and there's n there's no proof of the activity, but there is proof of, of activity going on and there too. I mean, they've done a number of, of episodes and stuff on his museum and I, I just think, that, again, there's way too many coincidences that would have to occur for something more to not be going on there. Yeah. And a number of the, the objects that he has do have confirmed tragic backstories and events that that took place as a result of the object um, becoming cursed or haunted after the fact so obviously this one's tough to know either way but i do think it's it's just convenient that i i think the hoax kind of falls apart for me because of the way kevin manis is, is acting about it and is wanting to clearly regain possession of it because he now it's been deemed the world's most haunted objects why wouldn't you want to have that object and charge people to come and see it right what's confusing to me is that if this was a creative writing practice and he's like i made the whole thing up as far as i could find where's the real story where's the true story then to this origin i don't I, like he's never presented a different story like i just found it at an estate sale and then i just made it up I, like do you know anything beyond that because if the origins may be unclear to him, then we actually don't know. I think that's the biggest thing too, is there's just, we don't know. Yeah. And there's obviously it could just be a mini, mini bar from, you know, 20th century New York, but it could also be still have still the six properties, this wine yeah. cabinet from somewhere. Yeah. But as far as the Dybbuk goes, that is a, legitimate thing in jewish folklore correct yes yeah. yes as far as it manifesting in an object i couldn't find anything besides basically this case and beyond um but this was the first iteration of a dybbuk ever inhabiting a physical object because generally it would be inhabiting the person yes so yeah i mean that's where it gets into the realm of who really fucking knows what's going on yeah it could be just mischaracterized as a dybbuk it might not be a dybbuk at all right yeah it could just be some other type of supernatural energy right yeah very very interesting so here on lights out we're all big fans of horror stories right and if you're a big fan of horror stories you're probably going to be a big fan of eli roth he's the director of horror films like hostel cabin fever the green inferno knock knock great movies i know i was terrified of hostile when it came out when i was i think i was in middle school at the time terrifying movie um he's also the host of two horror podcasts on a ghost room in my life with eli roth from travel channel hear the real life stories of people who have been through terrifying confrontations with the unknown but they come out alive and for this podcast that he's doing 
Eli has gone through hundreds of submissions from real people whose lives have been just terrorized and ravaged by ghosts, demons, or sinister entities. So if you get a kick out of these stories, you definitely got to check his show out. Each episode focuses on one person's story that's handpicked and introduced by Eli Roth and retold by the victims themselves. And these stories, they're some of the most absolutely terrifying stories I've ever heard. And now you can listen to a new season of all new real life stories of terror on A Ghost Ruined My Life with Eli Roth. And listen to A Ghost Story Ruined My Life with Eli Roth wherever you get your podcasts. The next curse object on the list was owned by James Dean. The famous 1950s Hollywood actor was most known for his iconic portrayal of teenage angst in the movie Rebel Without a Cause, but he wouldn't even live to see it premiere. At only 24 years old, he would die in a near head-on collision in his 1955 Porsche 550 Spider. At the time, James was at the height of his career. He had come from a small town in Indiana and somehow made it big in Hollywood. And he would go on to be the first actor to receive a posthumous Academy Award for Best Actor for his role in East of Eden. While his movie career skyrocketed, so did his fascination with race cars, and he began driving competitively. And he got first place in the novice class and second place at the main event at the Palm Springs Road Races. He placed a few more times and made some money off of his wins. After a while, he was ready to move on to bigger and better competitions. But mechanical problems and his acting career scheduling always seemed to get in the way. A Warner Brothers stunt driver and James's friend and photographer, Bill Hickman, eventually gave James the racing nickname, Little Bastard. Supposedly, the president of Warner Brothers had called James a little bastard after he refused to get out of his temporary trailer used while filming East of Eden, and the studio hated the fact that James still raced during filming. They even tried to put a racing ban in his contract. But just like his character Jim Stark, James rebelled, ever since his friend Bill sarcastically called him Little Bastard. Bill, on the other hand, became Big Bastard. In September of 1955, James got a new car and entered the upcoming Salinas Road Race event scheduled for October 1st through the 2nd. What's strange about this is that a week before his tragic death, James met Alec Guinness. And if you don't know him, he's famous for playing the original Obi-Wan in Star Wars. I know Daniel's a big Star Wars fan, aren't you? I am, yes. Uh, um, I feel like Alec Guinness has a has an aura about him, especially because he's played Obi-Wan, but they met in LA on September 23rd, 1955. After failing to get a table at a restaurant, Alec and a friend then ran into James Dean and he invited them to his table at the same restaurant. After dinner, James showed him his new car, the 550 Spider. This was one of many cars he had bought and traded in the past year and it had just gotten shipped in from Germany. He had already painted the words little bastard in cursive on the back end along with his racing number 130 on the hood and the doors. But right as Alex saw the sports car, he immediately got a strange feeling. He must have been using some sort of Jedi clairvoyance here because he told James, please never get in it. If you get in that car, you will be found dead in it by this time next week. But in the end, I guess a warning from uh, Obi-Wan wasn't going to scare him off. Driving was James's passion, and he was good at it, so he was going to plan on racing. Yeah, that's wild, though, that he had this, like, premonition. Yeah, isn't that crazy? So on September 30th, 1955, James and his mechanic were at Competition Motors in Hollywood, prepping the car for the big race. They originally planned on towing the little bastard to the race, but James's mechanic, Rolf Wutherick, noticed the car didn't have enough mileage to qualify for the race. Other reports said that James also needed to get used to how the car handled, so Rolf suggested that James drive it to Salinas instead. His good friend Bill the Big Bastard would also join. After slamming some coffee and donuts and filling up on gas, they headed out around 2 p.m. Within an hour and a half, James was stopped by a highway patrol officer for going 65 in a 55 zone, as mechanic Rolf was in the passenger seat. Bill was also going 65, but because he was towing a trailer, he was now 20 miles per hour over the speed limit, so he got a ticket as well. After the speeding tickets were handed over, they took off-road shortcuts with higher speed limits. Hours passed without trouble, but at one point they stopped to get food and drinks with a few other drivers headed to the same race. And then they were back on the road again. 
Around 5.45 p.m., a black and white 1954 Tudor was heading down Route 466 just west of Shandon. The driver of that vehicle, 23-year-old Donald Turnipseed, yes, that's his last name, was heading in the opposite direction than James. When their paths crossed, Donald tried to make a left turn at a junction. James and Rolf watched in horror as the Ford began crossing the center line to turn in front of them. James quickly pulled the wheel trying to dodge the Ford, but didn't have enough time, and the two cars collided almost head on. The spider's driver's side took the brunt of the impact. It was originally reported that Dean was going 85 miles per hour, but investigators later concluded he was likely only going 55 miles per hour, which was the speed limit. At the moment of impact, the heavier Ford did a broad slide for almost 40 feet before coming to a stop, but the much lighter 550 Spider began doing cartwheels down the road. It went head over heels about three or four times before landing in a gully beside the shoulder. The mechanic Rolf was thrown from the vehicle mid-air, which ended up saving his life. Meanwhile, James was locked inside of this metal death trap. Some say the car looked like a ball of tinfoil by the time it reached the gully. A witness who had nursing experience ran to James Dean's car. She reached for his neck, but only felt a slow, weak pulse. He was alive, but just barely. The rest of his crew arrived a few minutes after the crash, and Bill Hickman helped pull his friend from the wreckage. James's left foot had been crushed between the clutch pedal and the brake, which made it hard to get him out. After they got him free, reports claimed that James died while Bill held on to him on the side of the road. He had broken his neck and suffered massive internal and external injuries, including multiple fractures to the jaw, both arms broken, and several internal injuries. He was placed in an ambulance alongside his mechanic, Rolf, but the closest hospital was a half hour away. Rolf ended up surviving after a broken jaw and hip and femur injuries that required surgery, but James was pronounced dead on arrival at 6.20 p.m. As for the driver of the other car, Donald Turnipseed, he survived after only suffering from some facial bruising and a bloody nose. After an investigation, the wreck was officially ruled an accident, and today Route 466 is now Route 46. The intersection where the accident happened is named the James Dean Memorial Junction, and James's death made him even more famous than before. His end was so tragic that the car and its parts were suspected of being cursed, and what was left of the car was split between other racers and car enthusiasts. Supposedly, the engine and a few other parts went to another race car driver, Dr. William Eshrick. He installed the engine in his Lotus, and parts from the transaxle went into another racing car that belonged to William's colleague, Dr. Troy McHenry. Less than a year later, their cars crashed in the same street race. Troy ended up losing control and hitting a tree, and the impact killed him instantly. William's wheels mysteriously locked up and his car rolled over mid-turn, and he was critically injured but was lucky enough to survive. Crazy that they were just taking a totaled car and reinstalling those parts into yeah, other cars. Yeah, that's surprising. But the rest of Little Bastard was owned by George Harris. He had bought it for $2,500, and he'd actually originally customized the car for James Dean before it was destroyed. George was also famous for customizing a plethora of Hollywood cars. One was Adam West's 1960s Batmobile, the Munster Coach, the Beverly Hillbillies Jalopy, and uh, Kit, which was the car from Knight Rider. George's original goal was to rebuild James's car and get it close to the original condition, but he soon realized that was basically impossible. The car was far too damaged. If you ever get a chance to look at the pictures of it, it's just a... It's like a soda can. Yeah. Smashed. Completely basically. smashed. So instead, he lent the remains of the car out to the National Safety Council. The Twisted Metal toured around the country to promote safe driving and act as a testament to how violent car accidents can be, especially before. I feel like we have such good safety standards now for cars that just weren't around back then. And features, too. Like, the technology's just gotten so much better. Definitely. Strange enough, back in 1955, which was the same year that James Dean had died, he filmed a short PSA for road safety. So here's a short clip of that PSA. A good point. I uh, I used to fly around quite a bit. You know, I took a lot of unnecessary chances on the highways. And I started racing. And uh, now I drive on the highways. I'm uh, extra cautious because uh, no one knows what they're doing. Half the time, you don't know what this guy's going to do with that one. On a track, 
There are a lot of men who spend a lot of time developing rules and uh, ways of safety. And uh, I find myself being very, very cautious on the highway. I don't have the urge to, to speed on the highway. People say racing is dangerous, but I'll take my chances on the track any day than on a highway. Well, Gig, I think I'd better take off. Oh, wait a minute, Jimmy. Um, one more question. Do you have any special advice for the young people who drive? Take it easy driving. The life you might say might be mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's an odd interview. Yeah, right? And also strange last words uh kind of haunting you think but, that was scripted though I, I think a little bit yeah it kind of seems scripted to me but still i mean it's definitely haunting to hear that come yeah out of his mouth. the life you save might be mine right yeah, that didn't work out for him yeah i think he was genuine it might have been unscripted earlier in that but i think the that and i feel like that goodbye been, was like yeah oh yeah before you leave yeah but yeah there he is he's so young too it's yeah crazy to think about as George began hauling around that mangled car around the country, he immediately ran into some problems. It crushed his mechanic's leg when it first arrived at his garage. Soon after, the garage it was kept in mysteriously burst into flames and burned to the ground. Somehow, the wrecked car sustained almost no damage from the fire besides a few melted tires. Supposedly, the car has also torn off the arm of a man who once tried to steal it. But one of the craziest things that happened on tour was when a transport driver was hauling it cross-country. A man named George Varkas was supposed to haul the car on his flatbed truck, and during an accident on the road, he was ejected from the truck and landed beside the flatbed. The remains of the Porsche rolled off the side of the flatbed and crushed George to death. That's pretty eerie. After everything, the car just mysteriously disappeared. According to George, it was transported from Miami to LA in a sealed container in 1960. By the time it reached LA, that container was empty. Small pieces of the car still show up in museums and private collections, but many are still unverifiable. A trans axle that supposedly belonged to the car showed up in rural Massachusetts at some point, but it couldn't be confirmed as genuine. To this day, the car shell and most of its parts have never been found. In 2005, the Volo Auto Museum in Illinois offered a $1 million reward to anyone who could find the remains of the car. One man claimed that when he was six years old, his father and a few other men were hiding the car behind a fake wall in a building somewhere in Whatcom County, Washington, but the story couldn't be proven. Although the car is gone, some believe that the curse still lingered long after its disappearance. For example, in 1981, Rolf, the mechanic who survived the original car crash, suffered from severe psychological problems ever since. He suffered from depression and suicidal thoughts, and he also fell into alcoholism. Over the years, James Dean's fans sent Rolf abusive letters and even death threats because they thought he was responsible for the crash. Some even claimed that he might have been the one driving, but as far as we know, that is not true. Rolf went on to marry and divorce four different women over the years. His fourth and final wife was a woman named Doris. And on May 1st, 1967, Rolf grabbed a knife, snuck into the bedroom, and stabbed her 14 times. She ended up miraculously surviving the near-fatal wounds, but then he tried to take his own life, but he also survived. In 1969, he was found guilty of attempted manslaughter. He ended up being sent to a mental institution in Wysena instead of prison. He would never marry again, luckily, but he would eventually return to his work, and after leaving the institution, he returned as a mechanic and even a driver, but this curse seemed to follow him. And in July of 1981, he accepted an offer to be featured in a TV show about James's death. On July 22nd, 1981, it's believed that Rolf spent the night trying to figure out what he was going to say on the show. And maybe this guilt got to him or just couldn't handle it. But he then got into his Honda Civic while incredibly drunk and drove it directly into a house in Kupferzell, Germany. And just like James Dean, his car was totaled and he had to be hauled out of the wreckage and he was pronounced dead at the scene. A big thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's episode. We love HelloFresh here at Lights Out. I've been using HelloFresh for several years now. I actually pay for their service. I get four meals every single week. And I've got to say, there is not a single recipe that I've ever chosen 
that I just straight up didn't like. What makes HelloFresh great though is the fact that it saves you so much time and money. I don't have to go to the grocery store anymore. I don't really even have to plan out my meals because I just hop on the HelloFresh app, pre-select my meals, and I can do it for weeks in advance. So it's kind of set it and forget it. And then their boxes just show up at my door. Inside the boxes, you've got all the pre-portioned ingredients you need for each recipe all ready to go. It's easy to put these delicious recipes together in 30 minutes or less. Cleanup is a breeze and the food is to die for. I love HelloFresh too because there's tons of add-ons you can have. So if you have a pasta recipe, you can go and add garlic bread. There's desserts, there's snacks, there's even breakfast items. You could pretty much eat solely off of HelloFresh. And when you get HelloFresh, you know you're getting top-notch produce since it travels from the farm to your door in less than seven days. And a new season calls for new meals. And HelloFresh has a fresh fall lineup of delicious dinners and more to choose from. Take your pick from 40 weekly recipes that suit your lifestyle from veggie to family-friendly to fit and wholesome. So if you haven't tried HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash 50LightsOut and use code 50LightsOut for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash 50LightsOut and use code 50LightsOut for 50% off plus 15% off the next two months. It's no wonder that HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit, and boy, do I love it. A lot of uh, tragic events there. Yeah. This one, I think this one might have the most weight to it as well. I mean, not just emotionally, but also I, there's something crazy about this car that I don't really believe in cursed objects, but this is a crazy series of events with this thing. It is, but actually for me, this is the one that I believe is probably not cursed. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I just, because the the way that I, I believe in curses and how they are, you know, there's there's intention behind the curse being put on an object, and unless there's some origin story that we don't know about, why you know was at what point was the car actually cursed? I think that this is a ser- I think this is a series of coincidences, actually. Really? Okay. And I think there's probably more to the story that we don't know in and motive behind some of the events that happen here, uh, especially since it's surrounding a famous you know, a famous individual and, and the people involved with it. And there'd be motive to try to take this car from him or um, take his place, so to speak, that I think this is kind of just a series of unfortunate events that have nothing to do with like some sort of paranormal curse, wow. in my opinion. That is a lot of series of events. Yeah, though, no, it, it really <laughs> it's crazy. is. crazy. Either way, it's insane. But, if it's cursed or not, there's, clearly this, is, this series of events connected to this car is quite wild. Hollywood's crazy, you know, (laughs) like, like, you know, there's tons of crazy stories of things that happen to, you know, people in Hollywood and, and just famous people in general that to me, it doesn't seem as as crazy, um, of a story when you, when you consider all the, all the different things. I do think Rolf is, there's more to Rolf than, than we know. Yeah, for sure. It's like, it's surprising. I mean, if you look at this car, it's not that big. So how, you know. I guess James took the impact of the crash, but Rolf, why did Rolf fly out and James didn't fly out of the car? You know what I mean? Like what, what's going on? There? I think the metal might have trapped him on impact because it was mostly on he the driver's crunched side. and pinned inside. Meanwhile, he just was ejected. I doubt they were wearing seatbelts. What, 1955? Do we know when like seatbelts came out? Yeah, there's fly? probably, probably no seatbelts going on there. It's probably decades later. But then the fact that Rolf goes on to try to murder somebody and Rolf just seems like a crazy crazy dude yeah because it, it like is there some other motive there for them to try to take James out you know and and there's also the theory that this was kind of like a plan planned event right yeah there are some theories Donald turn up seed. Turn up seed. yeah people people point out that his name is <laughs> so strange that it's it kind of raised suspicions and like, oh, he turned and turn up. I don't know. People have tried to draw, connect the dots there, but I, I don't know if I'm on board with that. Well, it's like, how did this crash even happen? Wouldn't he have seen him turning? It seems like he was either just completely like, distracted. Yeah. Or I have no idea. Seems like an oncoming car would be the most visible thing to you in that moment. But it's all very sketchy, but I could also see a motive for crime happening here. Like, an intentional crash yeah to try to yeah. take him out of the race mm-hmm. and and take the car out of the race potentially somebody could have set this up i'm sure if we dug deep enough there's probably 
I'm sure there's some conspiracy theories to this one. For yeah. Sure. And uh, who knows, like James Dean has a pretty elaborate past with. So uh, like, are you more so referring to like, oh, this car, you know, kind of using the term cursed, like as a figurative speech, yeah, like, not oh, like, this is a cursed vehicle. But like when you, like, I'm looking at it from a perspective like of someone like someone put a hex on it yes, or something. Like this yeah. is, there is a intention behind this object being cursed yeah, by somebody. No, I'm saying it more as in like something has manifested into this thing to be so violent. Even if you look at it as a series of coincidences, I, that's a, uh, still wild to me it seems like yeah more of like a metaphorically cursed object okay than a actually like i'm comparing this to the other stuff on on the list right and to me it doesn't ha hold the same weight as some of the other origin stories behind the gravestone and the dybbuk box and things like that but but yeah for as a figure of speech yeah this thing's fucking cursed. <laughs> this like absolutely this cursed. thing needs to just be destroyed and it yeah. sounds like it's been destroyed or somebody's secretly in possession of it oh, somewhere man. i would love to know what happened to it it's probably in some billionaire's basement by now probably yeah it's probably like in a glass case somewhere yeah but that leads us to our very last cursed object where we'll be talking about today and there's only a few cursed objects more deadly than james dean's car and this one might just be it this is the bassano vase its origins date back to the 15th century and it's difficult to track its exact lifespan. And it's really hard to prove that it, it existed at all. But it's believed its journey began in the 15th century in a small village north of Napoli, Italy. On the night before a wedding, a bride-to-be was anonymously gifted a silver vase. It looked like nothing special, just a plain silver vase that weighed about four pounds. There were no intricate markings or decorations, but this was no ordinary vase. By morning, the bride was found dead on the floor of her room. And as the legend goes, her killer was never caught, or there was no killer at all. Not a shred of evidence or any clues were left behind. The only thing out of the ordinary was the silver vase that she clutched in her cold, dead hands. The vase soon made its way through her family members. The first to inherit it ended up dying only a few days later. It was then passed on to the next family member, not realizing there was something wrong. And one by one, they began to die. And after each death, the vase continued passing through the family's hands. And by the end of its killing streak, almost every last family member of the bride-to-be had died. Until finally, someone realized the source of the deaths was probably this strange silver vase. Some sources say the family tried to hide the vase where no one could find it, possibly burying it beneath sacred ground. Or the family gave it to a priest, hoping he could undo the curse or contain its evil energies. Whatever happened to it sealed the cursed object away for several hundred years until it disappeared without a trace, and it seemed like its kill streak was over. That was until it was uncovered in 1988. According to a legend, a man found it while excavating his backyard in Italy. There was a note inside that read, Beware, this vase brings death. But the man ignored the note and tossed it. After washing off the vase and realizing it was possibly hundreds of years old and made of silver, the man took it to an auction house. It was sold for over $2,000 to a local pharmacist. Three months later, that pharmacist died, and his grieving family sold it to a young doctor who was an art enthusiast. And like the others, the doctor was dead within a few months. By now, the Bassano vase had gotten a reputation, and no one wanted it except for an archaeologist fascinated by the vase. His family begged him not to bring it into the house, but the archaeologist wanted it on display for all to see. Three months later, to no one's surprise, he also died from a mysterious infection. It traded hands again, but this time it was bought by a skeptic who didn't believe in cursed objects. And guess what? He died too. Out of frustration, the victim's wife tossed the vase out of a window, but a passing police officer noticed the shining object flying into the street. He knocked on the woman's door and tried to return it, but she said she would rather pay a littering fine than take the vase back into her home. She told the officer to destroy it if he wanted to live. But the officer had other ideas. He took it home and then tried to donate it to a museum. But all the closest museums had already heard about the wicked Bassano vase and refused. With no other choice, the officer locked the vase in a lead box and buried it in a graveyard. And it was never seen again. Here's my theory on the Bassano vase. This is, if you look, if you Google search Bassano vase, or if you just Google search like cursed objects, this object is in every single list on the internet. But... I don't know. So I was curious, like, why is this thing so popular? 
you know, did it kill all these people? I don't know. It's hard to track it. There's not many records of it even existing. I think maybe at one point it had a picture of uh, in a newspaper. But here's my theory on on the vase. All right, let's hear it. So if it's true, if we're going to say that it's it has killed all these people it's come into contact with, and it's true that they buried it in a lead box, this might suggest that there was possibly some radioactivity going on. Hmm. Now, radioactivity of uranium wasn't discovered until 1896. And if this vase truly did exist and dated back to the 15th century, there were still some radioactive elements that people could find across metals. Like, uh, here's a list of a few thorianite, uranianite, or pitch blend. So maybe this silver vase wasn't silver at all. Possibly it had traces. It was made out of some radioactive metal. Yeah. Um, but would or, people die within months? Yeah, I don't know. That'd be a that's the thing. Hot vase there. But that's why I don't know. Is the story accurate in saying that these people were dying this quickly, or is that just you know as the folklore has gone on through word of mouth, it's it's might have changed along the way. But I don't know. Or somehow this vase had become irradiated along the way. I don't know. But since the radiation was undetectable back in the 15th century. They might have just been like, oh, this is just cursed. It's killing these people because it's just sitting in their home, possibly near them for so long. I don't know. Just a theory. Just something to think about, I guess. That was mine. All I right. don't know. Because it doesn't seem like what, if the motive was to like kill this whole family, or maybe it was just to kill the bride-to-be originally, and then coincidentally it was just passed through everyone and they died, but I don't know. Just a thought. What if it had like traces of the Black Death in there? <sighs> like, what if there was some like I'm thinking a logical I'm thinking a logical explanation could be there's some sort of bacteria or there's some disease or something that inside it is or, contained inside or on it or something, and it's just making people extremely sick, yeah, and killing them or poison perhaps. Yeah, what if poison. there's like it's laced with cyanide or something like that? True, or some type of poison that upon touching it can make you really sick and oftentimes you're not able to like determine that cause of death from from some poisons based on what it depends on what it is but maybe that's why they weren't able to identify it because i'm like if it was something like that you would think that eventually when all these people die they like identify what the cause of death is but it seems like they all kind of die from different things and so that's that's what makes it kind of weird is yeah. it would, sh should be consistent based on if it was something that was radioactive disease poison if it was poison you. though because they buried it and it was supposedly i mean as the story goes they buried it and it was gone for several hundred years so it's like is there even a poison that could because yeah. then it was killing people when it came back and like yeah that's when true resurfaced so that's why i was thinking radioactive material can survive for a very long time uh so that was why my theory was that but i don't know danny what do you think on this one I mean, I'm kind of on, on the lines with you, Austin, on that there might be some material in it that's harming people. I don't think it's radioactive, but maybe it's mercury. Mm. That, that might be, that would be my best guess, but uh, yeah. It's just like a vase made out of mercury. Well, maybe not made out of, but maybe like... Somehow inside of it? Yeah, yeah. Made with mercury in mind, but not made out of mercury. Because they think it was made out of silver, right? Yeah, that, said, well, that's what they say. That's what they yeah. think or yeah. whatever. It doesn't seem like anybody actually like took a sample from it and yeah, determined what was going on with out. it. Yeah. How long would it take to die from mercury poisoning though? I think that would depend on the levels. Because that's what I'm thinking. I mean, I guess if it was really, really high, either of those could probably kill you within a short amount of time, depending on how much was in there. Yeah, that's also to say like with radiation exposure, I don't know. Cause... A lethal dose of mercury is 200 milligrams. That's not that um, much. So, I guess. so if you spread it out over a whole vase, that's there. Yeah. And they did say they really didn't really know the cause of death of, of the people of the yeah, people that died. Right, it seemed like mysterious. So, because again, I mean, we don't we don't know the origin of this, and that's I think the hard part with a lot of these alleged haunted objects is we just don't know where they came from and who had them originally and why they were made. What was the purpose behind them? Yeah, because it's like why why would a vase be cursed? You know. Like that's kind of a weird object to do. Unless if someone had a 
some motivation to kill that first bride to be. That's what I think of. But yeah, I don't know what this one. Very, very weird. Which one is the most believable out of all the ones we talked about today to you guys, though? Which one would you be like, yeah, if there's any of these that was going to be cursed by somebody or a hex placed on them, it would be this. I think the one I believe in most, not that it is cursed, but just because it's so well documented would be the James Dean car. Not that it's actually like we were talking right. about, not the supernatural element of being cursed. But if there's some unexplained force at play here. I would say the James Dean story. It's just, that it's so crazy. And it's all well documented where a lot of the other ones, that's the tough part about folklore and, and just hauntings in general is if you're not documenting it from day one, it's just kind of hard to have a good record of things. But I don't know. What about you? Gravestone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. I love that one. It's just there's something about it that's seems, I don't know, seems believable to me. And it's just there's too many weird things that, that happen with that that I can't dismiss it. So, I, I mean, that was just that was my favorite of all of them, probably. Yeah, that's a crazy story. Uh, Danny, what about you? I think it's the vase. I think it just, since it's been around for, for such a long period of time, it's had more time to cook, I guess, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay. Um, but going back to that too, uh, in the 15th century Italy, mercury was a common uh, gilding metal for jewelry and uh, weapons. So I'm going to stick with the theory that it's mercury. Yeah, I like that. That's a, that's a good theory. Did they have um, like reported adverse effects from when it's in objects? Because isn't it more you have to consume it? That's why I like tuna fish. Yeah, does it sound like, like that. it? Or like what the old thermometers, I guess you, you actually have to like consume it, right? Or I guess, yeah, touching it. But I guess if you be. directly touched it, I'm sure it can absorb through the skin. Yeah, 100%. That's why uh, yeah. Mad Hatters were a thing in the uh, 18th and 19th century. Right. Well, that was lead, correct? No, that was mercury. Oh, was it? Yeah, that was mercury. Okay. <sighs> yeah, mercury is. That's a terrifying you metal. Want to stay away from what was the one did you guys ever listen to s town that podcast it was from the same makers who made a uh, cereal this is i don't know years ago s town it's just about this crazy guy they think they're getting into some maybe murder mystery i don't want to spoil too much of it but mercury comes into play oh, interesting. that's so that that's was like the weapon of choice it wasn't even a weapon it was just they were trying to figure out what was up with this guy the whole time and turns out he was doing all these crazy um metallurgy concoctions and he was using and that. he was making them crazy yeah oh interesting fried hmm. his brain weird yeah well we're gonna wrap up today's episode there let us know which which of these objects you're most afraid of we want to know and let us know if there's any objects you'd like to see in a future episode on cursed or haunted objects leave it in the comments for us below or if you're watching on spotify apple podcasts Join us on social media or come on over to YouTube. It's a good time over here. We do premiere the videos all, you know, live on Fridays at 1230 p.m. Mountain Time. But we'll leave you with that. We'll see you guys next week. And until then, lights out, everybody.